you're going to see a change as he goes through the war. He gets called up, and uh, this is his big chance. They say, as a result of all these things, why don't you take a tin can out in the North Atlantic? So he does, and he goes up on a boat, and he goes up to Argentia, and the war still hasn't started. It's the fall of uh, 41 now, but we're in the neutrality patrol, and Roosevelt is juggling things, and you can't be in the war, but lend lease is maybe coming. All these things are happening. They're trying to give all aid to Britain short of war. So Tom's in on this. Now, there's, I, I may have a little diver, different interpretation of this than, uh, than Professor Daly, but I think it'll ring a bell with some of you. <laughs> the chief petty officer who's chewing him out is not happy with what happened on the last watch, and that's what he's telling them. <laughs> he is chewing them out. And Red is sitting there with a cup of coffee, and the other guys are asleep, but the chief is holding mast on a few kids there. Now, I, that's an amazing, amazing shot, and for obvious reasons, this, this is a uh, tender with, with her small destroyers alongside, one of which Lee later went out on, and this is in Argentia. And uh, the, the hill on the left was called May West, for obvious reasons. But I, I've, I've always been struck by the, his ability with these, with these, I mean. So he goes out on the Gleaves an old destroyer, and he goes out with Eddie Pierce, and, and he, he, this is his introduction, and he's, he's in the Navy, and this just, I wanted to show you that picture on the left, because it's Life Magazine stamped on it there, uh, you see right, right here, and what it says basically is that Tom Lee ought to have first shot at these if they're ever available, the Lee family, but also it says Eddie Vance, Eddie, Eddie Pierce ought to have the first shot, really. You know, if we ever give these away, this guy here ought to get a shot at the picture. The old uh, uh, depth charge launchers, that, that, that later they're rolling them over the sides, you see in all the movies, but here they were launching them out with the launchers. And you see his ability, he's, he's a realist. And, you know, we, we'll hear again, he says, well, I just, I just looked at it and I painted what I saw. And there he is in his studio, and behind him is a, is a uh, painting that he entitled The Coxswain. The Coxswain is standing up there and kind of protecting these in the back end of a motor whaleboat. And that's one of his paintings. That always struck me, because it looks almost prehistoric, but what he's got on, of course, is a spray mask over his nose, so he's going to get iced up there, freezing in the North Atlantic. He could always grab a likeness. He comes home because what happens is Pearl Harbor happens, and he goes into port, and uh, they think, you know, where are we going to go? What's going to happen now? And he does all these paintings at home throughout the war. Let me go back one just to show you that. He doesn't paint these on site. You know, what he does is he goes out, he's with them for a month or so, longer in many cases, and then he comes back and he paints all these right here in El Paso from the sketches he made which Sarah talked about, <coughs> how, and you'll see some of his sketches, some of which Adair has, that he worked from when he recreated the paintings. But when he comes back, he's doing the paintings, and, uh, and now, now he's getting, you know, pretty well known. And people, uh, people want him, the other services want him. But uh, a friend of his in the Navy says, we're not gonna let this guy go, and he has influence with Life Magazine. So they say, we're going to send you out to the South Pacific. And now it's the summer of 42. And this is a name for a, for a former commandant of the Marine Corps, William Ward Burroughs. Uh, and he goes out to Pearl Harbor on the old Willie Ward Burroughs. And uh, as they're coming into Pearl, he's made friends with, it, with Butch, who's a water tender, part of the old Navy. And, and this was his gift. I mean, he dealt with generals, admirals, everybody. But he made no distinction. He said, I'm a civilian. I went anywhere on the boat. Uh, no problems. He said, I didn't. I. And so as they're coming into Diamond Head, he had come past Diamond Head, and they're getting ready to turn into Pearl. Butch commented, he said, he writes this down in his diary. He just struck me as great. Uh, Butch comes up to him and says, hey, uh, Mr. you know, Tom, we're, this is quite a town here. He says, you got anyone you want beat up on Hotel Street? You just let me know. <laughs> so that was Butch's idea of a pretty good liberty in Honolulu. So he's with the old Navy. 
But where do they send him? To his favorite ship, the Hornet. And he rides out to her with John Hersey, who of course became so well known over the years. And he says, I'll never forget how big she looked. How did they ride out? Someone said the- uh, Went out in a launch. Huh? And a motor wheel boat. Went out in a launch. She was anchored, anchored out there. So he's, he's exaggerated and foreshortened. Yeah. Okay. He said, a professor the other day said it's his vision of it. And I said, I said no, he saw it. Didn't, That's I mean, what so the artist does. Yeah, she was, she was anchored in the stream. She wasn't uh, So he goes to the Hornet, and he makes great friends with a lot of people. But the officer in the center, that's John Hersey on the right, the author, who won the Perlitzer for Bell for Adano and wrote so many other wonderful books. In the middle is a Oscar Dodson, who was a lieutenant commander, Naval Academy graduate, and he was air escort officer. But it wasn't like you had somebody protecting, you know, like a press officer goes around and he's with you all the time, doesn't like you ask troops any questions that might be inflammatory. He just was a guy that got them and turned them loose. They had full run of the ship, they didn't talk to anybody. They just went where they did, talked to what they did. So Oscar became a great friend. Oscar was a coin collector, and uh, they talk about some coins, and that pops up, pops up later, and it results in the title for a great book Tom wrote called The Grizzly from the Coral Sea. He could always grab a likeness. People who are not familiar with his work look at these. Uh, artists I've, I've talked to, and they, they just are mesmerized by his ability. Uh, now, you saw some things that Sarah put up that said, we don't want you to go out there and do portraits. We want you to get the action. Well, he did it all, because most of them were, couldn't do portraits the way Tom could. There he is sketching. He's sitting on the, the wheel of a TBM, a big torpedo bomber. Uh, you see how big they are. It was the biggest ship aboard carrier in those days. And over in the right, he and John Hersey are bending over their polywogs. They're crossing the equator, and they're going to the right to being introduced to the realm of King Neptune. Now, this was one of his favorite pilots. And although, you know, uh, maybe he painted a lot of pilots, you're going to see that he painted everybody. This, and this is one of the things he painted. Now, he did the sketch from life, of course, the painting on the left. But in the right, that's a concept, because obviously he was not sitting out in the wing taking a picture of, uh, of Gus. This is Gus Whithelm. But he did that on occasion like he did when uh, his friend Mac, the uh, torpedo bomber pilot, was coming home to the Hornet. She's turning into the wind down below, and they're going to come into the break. I, I, I don't have a lot of carrier landings. I have some, and uh, uh, it's a different way of life. There's absolutely no question about it. Silver Emerson, uh, he painted again from a distant point of view, and he's biting his tongue, and he liked him a lot. He was in one of the F-4F F squadrons there, and uh, we, we printed this on the cover of the magazine that I did the article about Tom Lee in, and we got a letter from a squadron mate who, he, says, he said he was, you know, they talked about silver and it just made us wonder why all things had to be. How could we lose this great guy? Because he's lost later on. And he's a striking fellow, and uh, they said, well, he got a lot of mail from a lot of girls in a lot of ports. <laughs> now, this is Tom Lee, because he paints everybody. This is an ordnance man, and he's got a 500-pounder, and he's trundling the bomb along, and he's going to put it on the elevator, and they're going to take it up to the flight deck, and they're going to hang it under a dive bomber. So he's, he's painting, trying to paint all aspects of life there. This was one of the big events in his life, uh, second, not the first. The Wasp is hit. She's bringing the 7th Marines into Guadalcanal. They landed on Guadalcanal on August 7th. Uh, other Marines, uh, which you may have seen some in the Pacific War, which unfortunately was not as good a series as uh, Band of Brothers, not, not by a long shot. But on the 15th, uh, a month later, they're bringing in the 7th Marine Regiment, and they hit the Wasp. She's escorting the transports. Torpedo hit her. And Tom is below decks, and he's talking to a, to a, a rating down there in the, uh, in the boiler room, and, he look, and there's this huge thump, he says, you know, coming through the water, because she's blowing. And it, he, they sense the sound waves through the water, and he says, the guy looked, I said, what was that? And the guy looked up, he says, we're no yellow cab, pal. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is, I think you have this. Don't you have this? This uh, is yours. Jamie Clement has it. Jamie has it, good. Uh, so that's what he does, you know, and he's seeing, he talks about the sky and what he's going to do because he's, 
he's searing it into his mind. What am I going to do? How am I going to depict this later? So that's the stuff of history. We're, we're, we're looking at it. And that was the final painting he, he did of, 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 of the wasp going up. He painted the island, as they call it, the superstructure. And right in here is where he and John Hersey and Oscar Dodson and a young man named Puck, also Quacky, nickname, we'll later hear a lot about. Uh, he wasn't allowed to paint the radar. They had a radar on the ship, but that was censored. He couldn't paint it. He, uh, he had things to do. He'd been on the boat for two months. And Hersey had gone ashore on Guadalcanal in early October. After the wasp was torpedoed, early October they put into Noumea, I believe, and he went ashore. Uh, he went to Guadalcanal. Tom stayed on the boat, and he leaves her on the night of the 21st, I believe it was, uh, and flies out, and that certainly says South Pacific, if anything does, a C-47 taken off on a uh, coral strip with a palm tree. And he, fair, he works his way back to Pearl Harbor. And he goes in to see Admiral Nimitz, and that's when Nimitz tells him, we lost your ship last night. He's showing him the painting that he did, this mighty wasp of, of the Hornet, because the Hornet was torpedoed and went down uh, five days after he left her. Um, I, I can tell a little side story. I mentioned it to some people last night, but I was, I was at Jim Lee's home, uh, uh, home here. I was at Tom's home with Jim Lee here. Yeah, Tom, his son Jim was out here a couple years ago. And, and I was sitting in the library and I was looking at these things and, you know, he's got first editions with letter from Willa Cather stuck in, you know, and all this stuff. And, uh, and Jim came in and he says, I want you to have this. And, you know, the sheet metal shop on the ship is always making ashtrays and everything in the world. I mean, they can do anything, so they don't have to buy ashtrays. They're made out of that, and then somebody puts a little design on So it's, a, it's an ashtray made in the sheet metal shop on the Hornet by the metalsmith, and it's got USS Hornet in it, and Tom took that off the boat with him. And I, I, uh, I, I mean, I just look at it and think, because she's in a lot of water now off the Solomon Islands. What a treasure. And, of course, of course, of course, Dick Berenhausen says, I think you ought to donate that. And I said, yeah, you're right. Let me think about that. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, what the hell? I mean, Jesus, I, I mean, I just was awed. I mean, Jim just. <laughs> Kavanaugh said the same thing, I'm sorry. <laughs> See, this was, this, don't ask me how they caught that shot, and I'm not sure this is the one that hit her, but that's the Hornet under attack. And what happened was a Japanese pilot was killed or wounded, and did he steer it in? Because the kamikazes ha aren't here yet. This is 42, so they have not resorted to the kamikaze. So a Japanese plane does crash into the signal bridge where he and his friends used to spend the, the night, and that's, that's what it looked like there after the hit. And one of the persons that he lost was this young picture of John Quackenbush. Now, uh, this is taken when he was a naval ROTC student at the University of Washington. It's the best picture I could find, and, and it's wonderful. And he loved this youngster. And he and they'd be up there at night. He was a um, uh, he was uh, with the uh, quartermaster division. He was responsible for keeping the troops fed and everything. He was a lieutenant JG at the time, I think. Uh, but for some reason, he called him Puck. Puck. It says last name was Puckett, and he called him Puck. But only after reading some letters and figuring a few things out did I discover that his real name was Quackenbush. And I'm, I'm not really sure why Tom decided to do that. Maybe to spare the family initially. And I tried to locate his family, and, and, and I tried, and I kind of backed off. And I think I really need to do it again, because I, I don't know if they realize that he has a daughter. Puck apparently had a daughter. But he figures in another story. And then he painted this, the Fighting Hornet, which he was not there to see, but he wanted to show you the, uh, the, the plane going into the signal bridge where he used to stand with his friends. And he did this one. Again, he was a, not an eyewitness to this, but he knew enough about it. This went into life not in, in a, 
a, a bit later, I don't know if any of you remember, that Life was very, well, they wouldn't publish. The, the War Department was not allowed the publication of any American dead. The first picture to appear was in Life magazine, and as I recall, the photographer was George Strzok, and it's Americans face down in the sand on Buna in New Guinea. Does anybody remember that picture? It's like a bas relief because the tides have come in and out and in and out, and, and these three men who were ambushed while on patrol along the beach are half, halfway buried with their face down. But that was the first time in World War II that officially they let them do this. And the next month, life ran these pictures too that Tom had done. And they're coming down the ropes. I went to a Hornet reunion in Philadelphia a couple of years and met three guys who had come down the ropes that day. Because she, she didn't go down initially. She was actually, uh, uh, she would hit by a torpedo. She was hit by a plane. She was actually torpedoed the next day and she, she went down. So he comes home and, and does all these paintings from the last trip, but now they got another job for him and the, and the Army Air Force says, enough, enough, enough. You're going out with our guys this time. And so they get him and he's getting ready to go out to China. And, and now he's, He's gonna, that's where he's going. This is now the summer of 43. It's August of 43. So he's up through Goose Bay, one of the different spruce, you know, the stunted trees, because there's not very much growing season up there at all. And this, uh, this is a wonderful picture. Fish Hassel on the right was a great Arctic pilot in the 20s and the 30s. And so when they established the, the route that they used in Operation Valero to ferry all the planes to England, you know, they'd go up through Newfoundland and Labrador and then over to Greenland and Iceland. And so you didn't have to fly the Atlantic. You, you kind of went by a checkerboard route there, stair-stepped your way across. And so he really liked fish. And, and Tom said he, he put a lot of guys to sleep there over, over a period of time. And he did some great sketching up there, too, in the different light, as you'll see. And this is a preliminary sketch, again, with notes on, flying, flying around Greenland. I could always grab a likeness. Great Arctic before from Norway, who got out of Norway ahead of the Nazis and was in uh, Iceland when he met him. And then he finally got to England and he reunited with his great friend from El Paso, Alex Stevens, who is on the right, and an early P-47 with the old birdcage canopy uh, behind them there. He got to spend a lot of time in London. He was very frustrated because he couldn't get his clearance to go on into the war zone and various things. And this plays later in why he doesn't end up going to Japan after the atomic bomb was dropped. One of the fighter pilots he knew there who had flown about, uh, I think he'd flown at the missions in the 40s, but he was brought over from his squadron to break in some new pilots. Later became the commanding general of the Maine Air National Guard and his daughter has called me. I've talked to her a number of times on the phone. Well, it's Tom Lee's guy, or it's a Turner's guy, or it's, it's, it's the sky, but it's the P-47s and the English countryside. And you've seen this, but there they are, sweating them out. They work on them all night long, they launch them and then they sit there, the ground crews, and wait for them to come home. And of course, they don't always all come home. He met Jet McNichol, a P-38 pilot in North Africa. And you know, Silver Emerson, his friend, didn't make it and Jet didn't make it either. Jimmy Doolittle pinned a DFC on this guy with his plaid cap on. I guess they were informal <laughs> enough though in those days. Or he was a character. You know, some people can get away with something. We all know that. There's some people who can get away with things that they string up other people for. And Jet was apparently one of those guys. And that's Doolittle, you know, who had led the uh, B-25s off Tom's ship, the Hornet, just four or five months before he got there. The Doolittle raid from uh, the Hornet uh, that bombed Tokyo is our first you know, trying to get back into the war, to get into the war a little bit. So now he's off to China, but he's, you know, he liked to shoot, he liked to record something of the scenes that he saw while he was going, and who knew about Iraq was going to affect us and many years later. And then he went over the hump into China. He actually flew it a couple times.
Henry Luce at Life Magazine had, had told Longwell, he said, look, tell Lee when he goes, get some scenes of just China. Not military, not anything, just China. Because, of course, Henry Luce was a missionary kid, as they say, and uh, had grown up in China. Child of missionary. So that's, that's, Tom did some of these scenes, and we'll see some more of them. And there's Teddy White. The great correspondent, they became good friends there in Chungking, and they're on a, a C-47, and they're going uh, to Kwai Lin, actually, and this was taken. But Teddy, of course, well known, but certainly for the making of the president in 1960, everybody remembers that one. Time correspondent. When, when the plane, when the Japanese plane went into the Hornet, and his young friend Puck was killed, that he learned of only later. Uh, Oscar Dodson, after that all happened, Oscar wrote him a letter. Oscar was, remember the naval officer that I mentioned was a coin collector? And uh, the California Grizzly. And they had talked out there about, you know, what would you be? And, uh, and Tom said, he said, this was romantic, I know, but he said, I'd be an Indian. I'd be an Indian, because oh, okay. okay. I wanted to be an Indian when I was a little kid. And he said, what would your sign be? There, your totem, he said, grizzly bear, strong, powerful. That would be my totem. So Oscar never forgot that. And when he sent him the letter, Tom records it after he got home from his trip to China, that the letter was there from Oscar telling him how sad and what happened to Puck. And you know, he knew the hornet was gone, but he, all these things had gone on. And there was the coin in it. And that's why he wrote the book, A Grizzly from the Coral Sea. And he tells the story of all this that happened while sitting in a restaurant uh, with one of his friends, Daryl Berrigan uh, and Teddy White. Teddy's not there, but Berrigan is. And he tells this story about what happened to this young kid on the carrier. And sitting in front of them on the table is this grizzly. They're talking about it. Luce didn't like this picture, because Luce was the, he's a big backer of Chiang Kai-shek, of course, you know, because Mao's sitting up there in the hills, and all the time he's going to take over what's going to happen. So he said, make him look like a gangster. And this was not published in uh, Life magazine. Didn't make it. But it's in the Harry Ransom Center now at uh, University of Texas, Austin. And of course, he painted Madame Chang, who was a Wellesley graduate, and all that background. And then he, he liked attractive girls. I mean, what the hell? He said, the beautiful Mrs. Wu. She was married to a correspondent. And that's his chop down there on, a, on that little red. But, but what striking pictures he was able, what striking portraits he was able to. So he heads off to Kwai Lin, which is where the P-40s are under General Chennault. These are the ones with the shark noses that you saw some that Professor Daly had. And, and again, no portraits. But this one, and that's what he looked like. Everybody says, and Hersey said, and they all agreed that it was the strongest face. Tom called it the strongest face he saw in the war. His widow is still alive in DC. I think, I believe, she was, I was at a place a couple of years ago and she was there. Uh, Anna, Anna, Anna Chanel. Anna. But again, he did, he did them working on, they got the cowling off with the shark nose on it and the back is a cart with a peasant. And then he's back home and so just like the sandstorm over a rock, he paints Ascension Island. Nimitz, whom he'd met in Hawaii, is on the cover there. And that, as you see the date on it, July 44, this is about two months before Peleliu, and there's a big discussion going to go along here. But in the meantime, he paints this thing, and this is also Harry Ransom, Grandfather China. He actually did this from a photograph. He, he put a composite together, some sketches, but this is... This is, to him, the essential China. The water buffalo, the rice being ground, and the patriarch standing. Now, here they are in Hawaii, MacArthur and Roosevelt. And Nimitz has got the pointer there. And, and one of the things they're deciding about, you know, Nimitz has come across Central Pacific, and MacArthur's coming up from the south. And they're talking about an island called Peleliu. And uh, the idea that we have to take it to protect MacArthur's right flank when he goes into the Philippines. And so they decide to go there. Now, 
the month before, Admiral Halsey, Bill Halsey, had written a message saying, we do not need to take Pelaru. We have intelligence that there's nothing there. I mean, there's an airstrip and there are a lot of Japanese, but they can't do anything. They're just sitting there. And there are no planes to speak of, and it's not a big deal. We can just bomb it and, you know, throw a few shells in there. Uh, but they don't do it, and so Lee goes up to Peleliu. And as late as two days, I think two to three, just before they land on Peleliu, Nimitz and one of his aides is Harold Stassen, who ran for president so many times. One of his aides is Harold Stassen. And uh, they take their heart in their hands, and... Uh, and he sends a message again to Nimitz saying, hey, we just picked up a pilot who was shot down near the Philippines and we got him, he was in the water, we got him. And he says, there's nobody there. There's nobody there. And Nimitz looks at it and one thing and another, but they've already committed. And so they cancel part of the operation, but they don't cancel Peleliu. And when you study the Pacific War, it's, it's, it's uh, what can you leapfrog and what can't you? And people will say, with hindsight, you could do this. This is not hindsight. So this is one, and Nimitz later considered it the, the major failure where we lost so many people, although there's even more to the story than that. But they went, and they didn't have to. Twice, Halsey told them, don't do it. So he goes up on the old Ormsby. He's always on these old rust buckets. And there's a young man that I wanted to show you. They never met, but Eugene Sledge was in the 5th Marines and went in on a beach adjacent to Tom and later wrote, what many consider the finest memoir of an infantryman in the war with the old breed at Peleliu and Okinawa. And he's featured in that second series that followed Band of Brothers, and the Sledge character is played by Joey Mazzello. He does a great job. And uh, put in perspective, Joey Mazzello was a little boy with a book in Jurassic Park. He was running around, being obnoxious. But he grows up and he plays Sledge. I, I went down, Mrs. I got to know Sledge, and Mrs. Sledge invited me to the premiere down in Mobile because they had all the folks in where they did it, but I just wanted you to slow, I mean, just so young, as Professor Daly talked about and Sarah, uh, and he had just come off Pillow. There's the island. Tom goes in uh, down here to the south, right in there. You see, it's still a little airstrip, and then this big, massive, they call it Bloody Nose Ridge. It was humor rogel in whatever dialect we're talking about. But, uh, and some of you may have seen, were any of you at uh, Professor Hatfield's lecture the other night? You may, you may have seen some of this, so bear with me a little bit. But he actually, I asked him about this. Everybody does. He says, is that your brother? Looks like your brother. And I said, no. He said, no, no, it wasn't my brother. He said, was it my brother? And then, I, then people, and I thought it was an Indian. And he got kind of cheekbones, but he got the war paint on and everything. And he said, no. I just glimpsed him through the smoke, and I painted what I saw. And this is, the, this is the advantage of the artist in that he's face down. He said, I was getting as low as I could. I mean, Joe Gallagher, the guy who wrote that great book, uh, When We Were Soldiers Once and Young, about the terrible battle in uh, Vietnam there that later made into a movie, uh, <laughs> asked Joe what he's doing. He says, I was trying to get myself as far down as I could, maybe feather out the edges, you know, like this. And the, Tom was, you know, everybody is. And so he recorded, you know, I mean, he's not even sketching now. This is, this is this great photographic memory. And this is a sketch for this terrible thing. The Marine's dead on his feet, and he doesn't know it. And a mortar fire has shattered his left arm and part of his face. And, and uh, we'll find out some more about this as, as we kind of wind things down. It's Tom there, first night, first afternoon. And then he's waiting for the counterattack. But they all get through the counterattack OK. And then he paints these images of the Marines. There's a 75 millimeter pack howitzer, and they're going through and they're reducing the island. And this is part of the story. Uh, Charlie Blue, uh, Professor Daly showed that, you know, trying to get the radio to work. They never do. And uh, they're, they're weary. And they, they've been on the island at this point only a couple of days. They're already, haven't slept, and so they're already getting out of it. And the blockhouse, a little more vivid here in color. And then. The shot of the attack, and on the right is uh, Frank Farrell, who was his escort officer, and they went into the beach together. At least they were together for that period of time. And Frank was later with him at Life Magazine when they wrote the captions for the photos, which 
uh, for the uh, paintings. And this is a chaplain, and uh, we have since found out that uh, I made an error in my book on this because we called him Chaplain Malone, but through the research uh, of, of a fine young man who was doing a story on a completely different subject, it turns out that this is a chaplain named Rufus Oki, and we're going to correct that. The problem was that they, at Life Magazine, they got it wrong too. And Tom, he said, I wrote Oki and all this, but they put Malone in for some reason. They got mixed up. So it was perpetuated, and I fell into the trap. But we'll try and try and fix that. And the painting everyone, you know, knows about. You know, you can see though there. I'm going to be talking over at the War Eagles Museum tomorrow about some of the airplanes, and and of course way up, uh, way up here is an OS2U Kingfisher doing spotting, and then the airplane rolling in on Bloody Nose Ridge, and here's another guy who's in trouble, and then the Marine. But in the background, a couple of guys are saying. You know, this is a samurai sword. I think I'll send it to my kid. You know, so the war goes on. You know, life goes on in the middle of a lot of bad things. And this is the bad thing about Peleliu, is they didn't need to take that ridge line, and, and Sledge talks about that. He said, okay, we're here. There's nobody on the airfield, although the assault across the airfield are terribly hit. And we spend days and months trying to reduce that. People are dying every day. And Chesty Puller, famous Marine, but Chesty kept throwing people into the meat grinder too. And Rupertus, who was in command, and they never should have done it. He said, hey, let's let them starve out. Or let them surrender. Of course, they don't surrender much, but why are we letting Marines get killed for nothing? It's a little speck that they can't hurt anybody. Very sad story. And, and Tom was part of it. So he comes back, <clears throat> and there he is in the studio with this, with this picture. And that's what he painted. And Longwell took a look at the paintings from Peleliu and, and according to Tom said, uh, print them and I never want to see them again. As the years went by, James Jones, you know, who wrote uh, From Here to Eternity and The Thin Red Light and was in fact wounded in Solomon's, questioned this painting. And, and Tom said, mortar fire does some peculiar things and Jones does not know what he's talking about. He said that's, and, uh, Tom has a letter, or had a letter, from a, a fellow who was on the beach who said, you know, I couldn't figure out who you were because you didn't have a rifle. Because Tom went in there with only a K-bar knife, which you'll see a picture of. And he said, but I saw the same thing you saw. Because you painted exactly what I saw. It was this dying Marine, or dead Marine. And there's the K-bar. I was in his studio interviewing him, and I looked over there, and I said, that's a K-bar. That's a Marine K-bar. And I said, what do you do with it? He said, all right. Sharpen the pencils with it. So he sharpened the pencils with the knife he carried on Peleliu, and Cynthia Farah took this photo and was kind enough to send it to us, and we were able to, to put it in the book. He had met a great, uh, someone who became a friend named Bill Chickering in San Francisco on his way out to go on the Hornet, and now here they are, they're getting ready for the invasion of Japan, and New Mexico's hit by a kamikaze, and his friend Chickering is killed. So he paints him. He was a life correspondent. And he credits Chickering with saying, <clears throat> with getting him with the uh, Fifth Marines, because when he was going back out to the Pacific in 44, he thought he was going to go out with the carriers again, perhaps. And Chickering got him and he said, hey, you know, why don't you go out with the infantrymen who really spill their guts on the ground? And that's what he did. So something happened between there and Hawaii because he had changed his mind and, you know, questions you wish you'd asked him. What you know, Chickering said that, and he records that, but he, he doesn't tell, so he did change his mind, and he went with the infantry. And then he came home. And it's Sarah and Tom and Jim, actually taken at a different time, but it's representative. And he painted this gorgeous picture to try and get the madness out of him. And then, of course, at the 2000 convention, don't ask me why, but I happened to be there at that time, and George Bush mentions Tom, that he lived on the sunny side of the mountain, and so now all of a sudden, who's Tom Lee? The press wants to know who Tom Lee is. So they write a story about him in the New York Times, and Victor Calzada takes a picture of him. Uh, Tom and his best girl, the son of 2000. You know, he never, um, 
and then he died just a year later. Tom, Tom never got into strategy in Grand Tactics. That was not his main game. He recorded the troops. Well, it doesn't make any difference what, but what was going on uh, in his grid space, so to speak? He didn't extrapolate from it. Uh, he talks about the guys trundling the bomb and the, uh, the fellow, the lookout, all of these things. He recorded them. Uh, he recorded, for example, the, uh, the two fighter pilots. You know, both of them are doomed, McNichol and Nichols. And goes on from there to the biggest event of his life, which really was Peleliu, after the Wasp, after the Hornet sinking. When people asked him who the Marine was in that landing craft, as I said, he said, I don't know. I just glimpsed him through the smoke, and I painted what I saw. But that Marine has come to represent every rifleman who ever rode a landing craft in the inferno of a heavily defended beach, whether it was at Peleliu or Normandy. Just as the rifleman who paid the price on the beach and the Marine with a 2,000 yard stare have come to represent what frontline combat does to the human psyche. You know, he rode into Pearl Harbor with Butch. He didn't go to Hotel Street and beat anybody up that we know of. And he was with the lookouts freezing in the North Atlantic. He stood the long watches of the night on his favorite ship, the Hornet, with Puck and Oscar and John Hersey, and he flew from the deck of the great ship with Gus Whithelm. He drank rye whiskey with Fish Hassel and Frobisher Bay on his way up north, and then he flew halfway around the world to paint Chiang Kai-shek and the, fly, the Flying Tigers at Kwai Lin. So he painted generalissimos and presidents, but he always said that the proudest moment of his life was when a chief petty officer on a tin can in the North Atlantic invited him to join the petty officers in their own mess. That's the kind of a man he was. Yeah. He devoted four years of his life in a sustained torrent of creative energy to record the travail of the men that he had flown with and sailed with and marched among. And by the time it was all over, he had become one of them. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer anything. Yes, sir. Uh, I've taught here at Community College for 40 years, and I've had students from World War II all the way up to Iraq and Afghanistan, some in my classes now. Many of them have dealt with this question. Why did I live through this? my friends did not. How did Tom Lee deal with this, either of you? What was his life thinking about this? Went through all this, he lived to an old age here in El Paso, and he came through it, and many of his friends did not. I can't think of a specific time he really said that. He wrote, he and J. Frank Doby wrote a lot, and, and what I recall him saying was that uh, what I think Professor Daly mentioned, that it, I, I'm going out there, I don't have a rifle, but I'm going to record what they did. He had no answer for it. You know, why, why McNichol was killed, why the rifle, and I, I never, uh, and, and he was, he considered them all heroes. They had to deal with this and face it, but no, I, I couldn't no, answer. Why, they died, but why, well, they why didn't he? Died? No, no, because, because there is no answer to that. There is a great picture, and I may insert it in here sometime. It, it's a pen and ink drawing, and it's a, it's, a, it's a rifleman from Vietnam, and he's got his helmet kind of down and a cigarette drooping out of the corner of his mouth. And he's, but you don't see him, you know, his eyes are shaded, it's magnificent. And, and the caption says, I wouldn't know about the draft lottery, but when your number comes up over here, that's it. Okay. That's all I could say. I don't, I, I, uh, Leon, I, I'm in the, the picture gallery, I'm pa paraphrasing, but he made a comment. He didn't understand what providence had brought him home, but he knew he couldn't rest at home until he had recorded what others had experienced. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did before turning to painting his, his wife. That's powerful. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, what? yeah. Okay, thank you very much.